Welcome to the 14th edition of Mini Medical School. Uh, I'm Dr. Larry Robinson. I'm the Vice Dean for Clinical Affairs and Graduate Medical Education. It does give me a great pleasure to welcome you to our 14th year of Mini Medical School. I'm just curious, how many people uh, is this the first year for? Oh, quite a few freshmen. Okay, good. How about second year? All right, how many people have been here three years? A few three years? Five years? Wow, that's great. Has anyone been here for every single one? Good job. Wow. And maybe another person back there. That's great. Well, welcome. We're delighted to have this opportunity to, to interact with you all and have you engage with some of the great and exciting things that, uh, that you'll see here. So some of you may be wondering, what is UW Medicine? I hear this on the radio and see it on TV, see it on the buses. What is UW Medicine? And it's really made up of eight entities, as you see here. So there's Harborview Medical Center over on the left. There's uh, University of Washington Medical Center, which is right next door here. There's Northwest Hospital and Medical Center and Valley Medical Center. These are uh, two of the latest entities to uh, join us in UW Medicine. And then we have a series of neighborhood clinics uh, throughout King County. UW Physicians is the practice group, the physicians that uh, uh, serve our UW uh, medicine entities. And we have the UW School of Medicine, that's where you are right now, this is the medical school. And we have Airlift Northwest. What's our mission? Well, it's an easy mission for me, for me to remember. It's to improve the health of the public. That's what we do through all our activities. We improve the health of the public by advancing medical knowledge, providing outstanding primary and specialty care to people in the region, and by preparing tomorrow's physicians, scientists, and healthcare professionals. We're kind of unique in a way. There's no other medical school in the United States that serves more than one state. We serve five states. We serve the states of Washington, Wyoming, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho. Those initials make up the acronym WAMI, which you may hear later on uh, during the series. This program is considered the benchmark academic model for the training and placing of physicians in underserved communities. Our WAMI states are shown here. You can see we have uh, five states uh, in the United States. This makes up about 27% of the land area in the United States, but only 3% of the population. So you can see we have a challenge in reaching out to the underserved because we have a sparsely uh, populated large land mass to take care of. Who are the people at UW Medicine? Well, we have more than 25,000 staff who contribute to the mission of UW Medicine. We have about 4,500 students and trainees, and we have about 2,300 employed faculty members, that's the people that we uh, uh, pay and employ directly, and more than 4,600 clinical faculty members, volunteer faculty members across the five-state region. Patient care is very active at UW Medicine. We have about 64,000 admissions per year to UW Medicine's four hospitals and about 1.6 million outpatient visits to our emergency rooms, our hospitals, and our clinics each year. We have a great deal of institutional leadership. We're ranked in the top two in the nation for training in primary care by US News and World Report, and this has been for many years. Our hospitals are ranked among the top medical centers by US News and World Report. And our School of Medicine is consistently among the top three schools for the level of NIH uh, funding. Uh, we've been number two for quite a few years, just under Harvard. So why are we here? Well, what's our mission to, uh, during this series? We want to inform you in an interactive way about the biomedical sciences, extending from basic research to patient care. We want to help you develop a better understanding of what a medical school does and the resources it has to offer, and to create a partnership with you in the appreciation of the science and the patient care at UW Medicine. And number one, we want to have fun together. We're really pleased to welcome back for their third year, probably their final year because we don't like to uh, burden someone with too many years, third year of Mini Medical School co-hosts. And these two have been just great co-hosts. They were in medical school together, they've been friends together for a long time, and you'll really enjoy how they uh, present uh, during this six uh, series, six lecture series. Doctors uh, Edith Cheng and Dr. Terry Brentnall are the two co-hosts. 
Dr. Cheng is professor of obstetrics and gynecology in the School of Medicine and chief of service at UW Medical Center. She's also medical director at prenatal genetics and fetal therapy program here at UW Medical Center. Dr. Brent Nall is the Walters Endowed Chair and Professor of Medicine and Gastroenterology at the UW School of Medicine, and she's an adjunct professor in the in Department of Pathology. She's the founder and director of the Pancreatic Cancer Surveillance Program here at UW Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Chen's, uh, Chang's uh, clinical expertise is in prenatal diagnosis, genetics, and maternal cystic fibrosis, and in women and fetuses with genetic uh, conditions. She earned her MS in genetic counseling at Sarah Lawrence College in Bronxville, New York, and her MD at the University of Washington here, where she also completed her residency. She's received, received numerous awards, including the prestigious UW Service Excellence Award, and she's been listed as a top doc in Seattle Magazine as well. This is her with her husband and family. Dr. Brentnall treats patients at UW Medical Center's Digestive Disease Center she diagnoses and treats illnesses of the gastrointestinal tract, and she has a special, special expertise in the origins, origins of pancreatic cancer. She led a team's discovery that a specific gene, paladin, when mutated, is associated with one type of familial pancreatic cancer. Here she is with family members. Uh, her pancreatic surveillance program at the University of Washington is ongoing for over 13 years with 190 patients and 140 families. She also earned her medical degree from the University of Washington and completed her residency in internal medicine at UCLA Medical Center. The first year that they were co-hosts, Julie had their two medical student pictures side by side up here. They won't let me show those again, so you won't see them this year. But you'll find them if you look, there's a series of pictures from medical students just outside in the hallway, and I'm sure you can find them. Tonight we're going to talk about meditation and hypnosis, and I'm going to turn it over to our co-hosts. So please have fun, uh, enjoy, enjoy the series. Thank you. I get to go first. Oh my hi. God. No. I'm Terry. Uh, this is Ida. Uh, hi, I'm, th this is Tina Fey and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Polar. Polar. Yeah. So we want to, uh, first of all, uh, say how great it was the Seahawks won. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I'm wearing my Seahawks tiara tonight. And I have to say that my, I have a big fa extended family on the East Coast, you know, and they, they are Eagles fans. And for the first time, I can say that we are on the map, right? Yeah, we are. We are on did the map. Did you say our bird beat your bird? Yes, we did. Yeah. And, you know, what is it? We're, we're being looked at for the next um, the Super Bowl site because of our, what, 12th man? Our, yeah, we got some so, 12th mans here. So I'm very excited. Now, tonight, uh, we're going to sort of ease you in. I, I saw that many of you are new, and I, I think you'll find that uh, you're, you're going to love this. Uh, we're going to ease you into it in a very gentle way. We're going to talk about meditation and hypnosis tonight, the mind, and how it has a lot of uh, management over the body. And I thought that one of the really interesting things that we're going to talk about tonight is sort of management of cravings, cravings using your yes. mind. And uh, Larry was talking earlier about a lot of land mass, and I know over the holidays I got a big ponderosa. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll learn how to manage that kind of thing. So without much ado, we're going to have uh, Edith present our first speaker. We were just talking about cravings, and you'll have to manage my um, shopping sprees on the weekends. My husband would really appreciate that. So. So we're going to begin with Sarah Bowen, and she's going to talk to us about meditation and hypnosis. Um, she is a clinical psychologist and acting assistant professor uh, in uh, psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the um, UW School of Medicine. Her research focuses primarily on mindfulness-based therapies for relapse prevention. Um, she focuses on mechanisms of change, including negative affect and thought suppression and craving. I am going to pay attention to this. Definitely. Um, she has met the Dalai Lama. Like you touched him and everything, so there's going to be like good karma from that. Um, so you can see she's co-author of the Mindfulness-Based Relapse Prevention um, for Addictive Behaviors, a Clinician's Guide. She's written lots of articles and book chapters on this and related topics. She's 
facilitated MBRP groups in private and county treatment agencies at the VA Medical Center in Seattle and in our adult and juvenile prison facilities. Um, she received her PhD in psychology uh, under Alan uh, Marlatat at UW's Addictive Behaviors Research Center, completed her internship at the VA Puget Sound Healthcare System, and her postdoc at the UW Department of Psychiatry. She's offered trainings to our researchers, our clinicians, both in the US and internationally, and skydiving in Hawaii. That's something that I can't do. Definitely can't do. So, without any ado, we introduce Dr. Sarah Bowen to teach us about meditation and to control our cravings. <laughs> So I just want to say thank you so much for the invitation. Um, this is such an exciting program. It's an honor to be part of this. Um, and as mentioned, I want to talk tonight about uh, meditation, mindfulness and meditation. I'm going to be talking a lot about how that relates to treatment of addiction and working with craving, because that's uh, my background. That's what I've been studying. Um, but I also want to just keep in mind as I'm, as I'm speaking about this that when we talk about addiction and addictive behaviors, I'll be talking a lot about substance abuse, but really that's, that's one manifestation of addiction and attachment. And I'm sure that we can all look in our own lives and our own minds um, and that of our friends and families and see many other manifestations as well. So talking about addiction, what I'm really speaking about tonight is um, the human tendency to engage in these behaviors that maybe don't serve us very well, and yet we seem to get caught in these, in these cycles. And um, we'll talk about how mindfulness and meditation may be able to help break some of these destructive behaviors and cycles. So before we begin, what is mindfulness? Um, just how many folks are familiar with mindfulness, mindfulness practice, either Personally, clinically, okay, good, so quite a few. So for many folks, there are probably definitions that are very familiar that we see a lot in medicine and psychology. Um, often it's described as developing a kind of attention that uh, focuses in the present moment um, and, and with an attitude of acceptance and non-judgment. So you can see here there are really three key pieces of this. Uh, there's this attention. And it's a systematic development of attention. So it's not just happening to pay attention for most of us. It really is working at intentionally training our minds to be able to pay attention in a way that maybe we're not used to. And paying attention to what's actually happening in the present moment. So if you think about today, how many places has your mind been? Tonight, coming here, how many places did your mind go? Versus how often were you paying attention to the feeling of your hands on the steering wheel or the feeling of your shirt as you put it on or whatever it might have been. We don't often pay attention to what's actually happening in the present moment. And doing this to um, simply to bring our awareness to what's happening, not necessarily to fix it, not to judge it, not to say I want more of that, I want less of that, but to practice actually just noticing what's happening and as best we can not judging that. Sounds simple enough. Um, another way that I uh, I like to think about this, especially in terms of looking at preventing relapse or behavior change, is what we are trying to bring our attention to is what is actually happening in the moment, our raw experience. And so this might be physical sensations that are happening in the body, it might be thoughts that are arising, and also bringing attention to how we tend to react to this, or what we might call feeling tone. So, Right now, I can feel my feet in my shoes. Pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, it's pretty neutral. I can feel like the light on my face. That's kind of pleasant. There's a feeling tone to that. So there's sort of what's happening and then our association with what's happening. That's kind of at the center. That's where we're trying to bring our focus when we're talking about mindfulness. However, where most of us live is in this kind of outer circle where we're reacting to what's happening. We have ideas about it, we have thoughts about it. So I feel a sensation in my head and I think, oh, uh oh, a headache. And I have this aversion to it. I start worrying about why do I have a headache? What if it doesn't go away? What if there's something seriously wrong with me? Do I have any aspirin? And we get caught up in these cycles rather than just observing what's actually happening. 
So we'll talk a little bit more about how this can tend to get us into trouble, especially when we look at addiction. So in this outer circle, this is kind of where oftentimes we tend to get into automatic reactive behaviors. So something will happen and we'll just immediately not like it and react to it. Um, it tends to be caught up in the past or the future. Oh no, what's going to happen with this headache? What did I do yesterday that made me have a headache today? Um, and this judgment, you know, what, what's wrong with me? I should relax more and not be so tense. I wouldn't have headaches. And what we're trying to do in mindfulness training and in meditation is to not necessarily even change that, although it would be nice to shift that a bit, but just notice what's the difference? What's actually happening now? There's a sensation in my head versus what is my mind adding on to it that might be actually making, me, making it harder for myself. So traditionally in the mindfulness literature, there's often this um, differentiation between pain and suffering. And we can see in the center circle here, this direct experience, we are sentient beings, so inevitably we will experience at some point uh, pain. But differentiating that from how, how does that sometimes called clean pain become true suffering? And might it be what our minds add to it and what we think about it and how we react to it that is actually causing suffering more than the actual experience itself? So I thought we could just, um, rather than talking about mindfulness and what it is, we could try a little something if you're up for it. Um, so participate if you'd like, not if you don't. No one will know the difference. Um, so for this practice, we're just going to practice paying attention for a couple moments. It can help to close your eyes if you'd like. You certainly don't have to. If you don't close your eyes, you might just sort of look down a little bit so you don't get too distracted by what's going on around you. And we're just going to take a few moments and pay attention to our experience, what's happening right now. So first, maybe just feel your, get a sense of your body sitting here. So you might feel your feet on the floor, or feel maybe how your body feels sitting in the chair. Maybe you can feel your back leaning against the chair. Maybe you can feel how your weight is supported by the chair. Get a sense of where your arms are resting, maybe on the desk or in your lap. Are your hands maybe folded together or in contact with another surface? Just kind of scanning through your body and getting a sense of that you have a body here. And perhaps just noticing different sensations, maybe temperature, or maybe you feel fabric of clothing against your skin. Maybe there are places where you feel some discomfort, tension. And then checking in, too, with the mind. Just noticing right now, what's happening in your mind? Perhaps there are thoughts, perhaps there are judgments about what we're doing, or perhaps the mind is wandering to what you're going to do later, things that happened earlier, the sounds in the room. Maybe the mind is racing, maybe it's foggy, maybe there are ideas about where you'd rather be. Just noticing whatever's happening in the mind right now. And then taking a moment to check in with how you're feeling. Maybe there's one feeling or emotion that's present, maybe several, maybe none. Sadness or peace or content, restlessness. And then taking a moment to just come back to the body again and notice that as you're sitting here, Without any effort on your part, your body is breathing, hopefully. So there's nothing you need to do to control your breath. Just take a moment and notice that as you sit here, the breath is coming in and out naturally. And see if you can just bring your attention to those sensations. So you might notice the air coming in through the nostrils and feel what those sensations are like the temperature, the friction. Or perhaps you notice the chest and the belly rising and falling as you inhale and exhale. So just choose one place in the body where you feel the breath the clearest and 
follow those sensations with your attention. Just seeing if you can follow the sensations of the in-breath and the out-breath. And then if the eyes are closed, you can just allow them to open. Okay, so great. This is the practice. This is what happens. This is what we do. We say, mind, I'd like you to go here and stay on this target. The breath, simple. That was a, a few minutes, right? And then here's that element when we looked at the definition of, of paying attention, okay, in the present moment. So inevitably what happens? The attention wanders. Oh, my pants. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it stays. Oftentimes it, it wanders pretty immediately. It's like a puppy. It's just like you ask it to stay, it goes. You ask it to stay, it goes, right? So we notice this. Oh, my attention's no longer on my breath. And we begin again. OK, let that go. Start over again. And return again to the present moment. OK? And this with a non judgmental attitude. So oftentimes, what can happen is well, let me ask did anyone have a judgment about themselves when their mind wandered off of the, off of the breath? I see a few nods out there. Oftentimes, it's like, oh, no, come on, come on, come on, come back. And there's a lot of myths that, um, that meditation and mindfulness means that you put your mind in one place and it stays there. And you have no thoughts. Good luck. <laughs> this is why people have been doing this for tens, tens, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. They still call it practice. It's always practice. The mind is wandering, you come back. So the practice is noticing that the mind has wandered and gently, as best we can without judgment, guiding it back. So it's the coming back that's the practice. It's not the being able to stay and not have any thoughts and be at peace. Okay. So a little bit about this practice and where it comes from. Um, oftentimes, when we talk about this in psychology and medicine, we talk about attentional control training and metacognition, and we have brain scans, and um, it's, it's, there, there's a, a language around it that is useful for getting grants and communicating with our colleagues. Um, there's also a very rich history to this practice that goes back um, over 2,500 years. Oftentimes, it's associated with Buddhism. There are certainly are mindfulness practices in Buddhism, but we also see them across many different kinds of practices and cultures uh, over the centuries. And it really uh, began, began coming to the West in about um, the 19th century when um, some people from Asia immigrated over to the West. And then in the 60s and 70s is when it really started coming into the States and getting popularized. There was a group of young, they were like maybe early 20s um, kids, really, hippies, that went over there. They went to India. They studied this. They loved it. They came back to the States. And they somehow scrambled some stuff together and started a center and started teaching. Um, and that was you know, 40 years ago almost now. Um, and it, it really was the beginning of this huge movement Many of these folks now are uh, clinical psychologists, which has also really helped bridge the gap and bring this into our contemporary psychology and medicine. These are people like Joseph Goldstein, Sharon Salzberg, Jack Kornfield, if those names sound familiar. And then that was really picked up again even more recently by what in, uh, in behavioral medicine we call this third wave of, of behavior therapy, where first it was radical behaviorism, and then it was cognitive behavioral therapy, and now there's this third wave that is, maybe we need to start looking at how we're relating to our experience and bring in some of that kind of metacognitive approach to this. Um, so it's, a, it's an exciting time. Um, I won't go through all of these, but just to show you that there are, uh, this has really spread over the last probably 10 or 15 years. Um, and we can see mindfulness and mindfulness-based therapies coming into uh, many, many different areas of both psychology and, and medical practice. The interesting thing about these interventions that really differentiates them from a lot of the other interventions we see in psychology is the base, the foundation, really is formal meditation practice. So there are some therapies that bring in mindfulness exercises every now and then. This um, school of therapies that's emerging that's called mindfulness-based therapies really have at the foundation from day one meditation, formal meditation practice like we just did. Also, uh, one characteristic of these therapies is that they ask of the clients or patients to begin practicing this as best they can 
six out of seven days to give a little wiggle room there, but pretty much daily in their lives. So send people home with you know, CDs of practices and say, we really want you to start right away getting this into your day-to-day -day life. So some of the interventions you see now, I'm sure many folks are familiar with MBSR, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. Originally, um, that was uh, uh, created by John Kabat-Zinn to work with people with chronic pain. About 10 years later, um, Zindel Siegel and colleagues adapted that to work with people with major depressive disorder um, to help them not relapse. And then here at UW, uh, working with Alan Marlat, the late Alan Marlat, we began to adapt those, uh, those kinds of formats and practices to work with addiction. So as I mentioned, this really started with uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction. How many folks are familiar with that program? OK, a few, great. Um, and this really was the first program that brought these meditation practices into a recognizable Western context. So John Kabat-Zinn was working with chronic pain patients who really had tried everything um, and, and had come to a place in their lives where they needed to accept that this is what they were going to be living with. And um, Dr. Kabat-Zinn took them in and said, OK, you're going to live with this the rest of your life. How, how can we help you still have a good life? and help you to relate to this differently, and secularize these practices in a way that they really hadn't been before. They'd been uh, in the context a lot of times of Buddhism. And he said, you know, that what we're doing is watching the mind here. And that, that can sometimes be a barrier to have it in a sort of religious context. So let's take these practices out that are really just watching our mind, observing our experience, and bring them into a context where they can be helpful to a broader, um, a broader population of people. And as I mentioned, um, here, yeah, there's, there's several studies now of MBSR. It's kind of been around the longest. Um, a lot of them sort of pilot in nature, but overall uh, that showing that they really have a um, pretty promising effects on both how people are relating to their illness and actually the symptoms of their illness. Zindel Siegel and colleagues uh, started recognizing that this could be very useful in helping people deal with the kind of cognitive patterns that we often see in depression and specifically depressive relapse. So oftentimes, people with major depression will, um, will go into remission, and then something will happen in their lives where they have a, a sad mood, and they immediately click into an old sort of rut of thinking, of like, oh no, I'm getting sad again, this is going to start again, and they kind of go on this cycle down. Um, and he thought that this might be a really useful way for people to start observing that pattern in their own mind and have some agency over that. And there have been um, a couple very uh, strong studies of this as well, showing that it, um, it's very helpful in, in helping people not relapse to major depression. So Dr. Alan Marlatt here at University of Washington um, was, is, uh, was studying uh, prevention of relapse for several decades, looking at people who got out of treatment, most of whom relapsed, 60 to 80 percent, depending on the study you're looking at, and said, you know, how can we help people not relapse? And he sort of on the side had his own secret meditation practice. And this was back before mindfulness was acceptable and popular. And so um, he was sort of secretly over here looking at meditation and then doing his relapse prevention cognitive behavioral work out here. And then finally kind of began in early 2000 to say, you know what, we need to kind of bring these together and start talking about this. And this is a, a seminal article that he wrote in 2002 in which he said that not only is this helpful, this, this learning to observe the mind, but this is essential to understanding how our mind behaves, how our thoughts and ex expectations can either facilitate these patterns of relapse or reduce these patterns of relapse. So to look at how this might be helpful, um, let's look at a, just a basic kind of behavioral perspective on what relapse is, how does it happen. So let's say a person is coming out of, of treatment um, and they're maybe been abstaining for a month or so. Um, this person likely has some vulnerabilities, some things in their family, perhaps genetic also, that put them at, at risk for relapse. So we kind of have that in the background. And then let's say this person this is walking down the street and encounters a trigger. They run into someone who they used to drink with. And immediately, there's typically a sense of um, discomfort or dissatisfaction. So let's first say this person's kind of having a bad day. They see a friend who says, hey, come have a drink with me, and think, you know, I'm not feeling great. 
I don't like how things are going right now. I'm uncomfortable, so I kind of want something to relieve this. I would love to go have a drink. And that can initially, that can turn into craving, especially for someone with a history of addiction. And then often, not surprisingly, of course, we know that craving will lead to use, substance use. So the problem here is that there is some alleviation. Otherwise, this cycle wouldn't be such a strong, um, such a strong behavioral pattern. The substance use does bring some initial alleviation, which then kind of strengthens that craving cycle. It reinforces that. But then, of course, there's what uh, Dr. Marlite called the abstinence violation effect. Okay, so you use, immediately maybe I feel a little better, but then all the shame comes, the guilt. I knew I couldn't do this. I've let everybody down. I had 30 days, now I have zero. All these things that are happening that make me feel more uncomfortable, more dissatisfied, and it kind of perpetuates this relapse cycle. If you talk to people with uh, histories of addiction, they often describe this kind of process as feeling very automatic. Like, I don't know how it happened again. I just, there was a trigger, and I just fell in, and it, and it went, and went, and went. It just happens repeatedly, and it feels like it's out of my control. So how can we bring mindfulness into this kind of cycle? Again, whether it's substance abuse, whether it's food-related, whether it's anger and aggression, whatever these behavioral cycles might be. If we look again at that definition that we looked at in the beginning, paying attention. So by training our mind to pay better attention, we can have a direct observation of what's happening. So we can actually look at, okay, wait, let me just get a sense so I can see, so it's not so automatic. Let me get a sense of what's actually happening in the mind. And so I can be aware of these things that trigger me, and I can be aware of how I tend to react to these triggers. And this alone, just this awareness, may start to interrupt those automatic behaviors. Bringing... Uh, attention to the, to the present moment experience. Um, oftentimes, there is this, um, this need to uh, fix a moment. You know, I don't like how things are right now. I want them to be different. I want to get rid of what I have or I want what I don't have. And bringing attention and this sense of acceptance and non-judgment can often help uh, practice being with things that may be uncomfortable without having to reach for something to fix it. Another way that we work with mindfulness in addictions is um, craving has shown, I mean, we know this intuitively, but of course we need a bunch of data to back it up, but there are many studies, of course, that show that craving leads to substance use. Craving leads to relapse. Craving is a big problem and is often seen as sort of the enemy in addictions. Um, so by, by taking a closer look at craving, all right, what am I actually experiencing when this big monster of craving comes up. Okay, what is craving actually made of? It's some thoughts. It may be some physical sensations in the body. There may be some emotions. And there's this urge to react to it. It has a sense of urgency to it. So we begin to, and when we work clinically with folks, we begin to teach them how to observe the craving rather than like, oh no, craving, I have to get rid of it. Like, okay, wait a moment. What's actually happening here? Oh, it's some thoughts, sensations. There's an urge. And also to kind of look at, you know, when there's a craving, oftentimes it's not about reaching for the substance itself. It's about wanting to get rid of the experience that I'm having. I don't want to feel this way. What I actually need is to feel safe or to feel loved or to feel some comfort or to feel some relief. And I'm going to go to this to get it. But it may not actually be that that I need. It may be something else. So learning to look at craving a bit differently so that we can break this pattern where craving automatically leads to use. And we can say, OK, when a craving comes, instead of initially reaching for that, maybe we can have some curiosity and some gentleness and begin to look at this a little bit differently. Uh, a related technique that, that we use oftentimes in working with clients is uh, what we call urge surfing. And this is the same kind of idea where um, we're asking people to, as an urge or craving arises, rather than having to react immediately to it, to ask them to stay with this discomfort. And we actually lead them through this in session. So we have them kind of elicit a, a craving or an urge and lead them through staying with it. What's it like to actually sit with that instead of react to it? And what's it like to stay with it, maybe using the breath as a way to kind of stay steady, and ride it, almost like you would ride a wave, instead of trying to fight it or like getting wiped out for it or running from it. What's it like to just ride it? Because eventually it will pass. 
what the subjective experience often is, is that there's this intensity that's going to go up and up and up and up until I do something to make it stop, grab for something to make this stop. Otherwise, it's going to keep going. In reality, what we know is it looks more like this, right? It doesn't go up and up forever. It goes, it peaks. If we can stay with it, it will subside. And if we can be with this over time, what we know from perhaps our own experiences and from studies is that when we can be with something that's this triggering in a gentle way, the intensity of it also tends to decrease over time. So just really briefly, I want to um, tell you about a couple studies that we've done. Uh, we started looking at this um, with a population of inmates in a, a jail that was minimum security. Most people were there on substance-related charges. And they were involved in a very intense meditation course called Vipassana meditation, um, in which they were asked to be silent for 10 days. They uh, were housed in a separate unit of the jail. They had to give out their cigarettes. They ate all vegetarian meals. Um, the guards were taking bets on how long they would last. <laughs> um, and this wasn't specifically about substance abuse. This is a traditional practice that goes back thousands of years, and it was taught as such. So it didn't focus specifically on addiction, but a lot of the practice is about being with discomfort like we were just talking about, ways of being with discomfort without reacting, ways of observing what the mind and body does. And we followed these folks after they were released. They were there in fairly short sentences. So three months after they were released, um, I'll hear a little bit about our sample here. Um, we, uh, we wanted to see what, what was going on for them. Um, a caveat here, this wasn't a, a randomized study. It was quasi-experimental. Uh, so we had a match control group, basically. And here's the um, breakdown of the ethnicity and race of our sample. Give you a little picture of, of what folks we were working with. Um, primary substance uses here were uh, marijuana, crack, alcohol. Uh, we found reductions on all of those at three months as compared to the control group, as well as reductions in the consequences of use. So even when they were using, they were getting in less legal trouble. They were having fewer um, health problems. They were using perhaps more responsibly. And we also found improvements in outcomes such as um, optimism, depression, anxiety, hostility. So we found that quite, uh, quite encouraging um, and wanted to find a way to, rather than have 10-day courses where you get up at 4 and meditate for 10 hours, find a way to bring this more into a context that might be uh, more attractive and feasible to many of our own patients and clients. So we began to um, integrate uh, relapse prevention, cognitive behavioral relapse prevention, with some of these mindfulness-based therapies I told you about before, and came up with this program, um, integrating really kind of the Western and the Eastern approaches to addiction and, and the mind. That looked like a typical outpatient, eight-week, two-hour weekly sessions. And each session has formal meditation, like we just did together, um, and also informal practices, things like the urge surfing that I just told you about, where we give clients a way to take these practices out into their lives, to be useful in their, in their lives. And then also some more cognitive behavioral kind of thought record sorts of approaches as well, integrated into this program. So some of the, uh, some of the core practices that we do, we start with, just as MBSR does, as some of the other mindfulness practices do, the very first thing we do in the group is we pass out a bunch of raisins, and we have people like look at them and smell them and listen to them and notice everything about them. And um, it's a very odd sort of uh, experiment, and people are you know, often kind of judging and laughing and uncomfortable. And, um, but the intention here is to, one, sort of demystify this practice. You don't have to sit in lotus position and you know, say Sanskrit words. It doesn't have to be anything sort of mysterious. We're really just paying attention to something that we typically would think is unimportant or aversive or silly. It could be a raisin. And then we move from that to other areas of experience. Um, so we have people then in their lives from that first week start to pay attention to the little things that they don't typically pay attention to, putting on a shoe, brushing their teeth, etc. Then we shift that attention to the body. And we say, OK, the way you paid attention to that raisin Pay attention to your body. What sensations do you feel right now in your feet? And we do this sort of scan through the body of learning to pay attention. 
And we move from that to, okay, now to the breath, to emotions, to thoughts. Let's pay attention to this whole system and how it's working. And then we move into exercises like I just uh, explained where, okay, you know, where the rubber meets the road here, how, how can this be helpful? When you really are on the verge of acting in a way that's not going to serve you well, how can these practices be helpful? And let's practice those. And then finally, we spend quite a bit of time working on shifting that kind of judgment and shame, especially that comes around lapse and relapse, and um, practicing relating to these experiences in ourselves more kindly. So you can see here with this motto we looked at in the beginning, how oftentimes in a group, we'll do a meditation. I'll ask how it went. Someone will say, I, can, I can't do this. OK, so right there, this is a perfect example. That sounds like a thought. Your mind is reacting to something. What happened before that thought? Do you remember? And the person might say, oh, yeah, my knee hurt, and there was restlessness there. So right there, we're learning to differentiate. OK, so there was a sensation, a feeling of restlessness, and then the mind jumped in and said, I can't do this, and made some truth out of that. With the idea that as we do this training and continue this training, it generalizes out into life, where if this person is having some emotional discomfort, let's say, in their lives, and they have a thought like, I can't handle this, I have to drink, I can't do this, they can learn to differentiate, OK, that's my mind. My mind is jumping in here. What's actually happening? OK, there's some discomfort. Can I be with that? Yeah, I probably can. We also uh, do a lot of practices around becoming more familiar with individual, uh, what we call relapse signatures. So what does your mind tend to do? So then when it does that, you can recognize it and it doesn't trick you. So we have an exercise where we say, what are your top 10 thoughts? Where your mind comes in and tells you these things. And by recognizing these, we can say, OK, I, I recognize now. That's my mind coming in and telling me things. That's not necessarily true. And then looking at how this might play out in a typical relapse cycle. So, OK, you encounter a trigger. What do you think might happen? And learning how to kind of map out an individual signature so that it becomes recognizable when it, when it begins to happen. Um, I'm going to just move through this for the sake of time. Just a progressive training, basically, as I explained what we're doing from the beginning with the raisin up until really noticing behavioral patterns and much more nuanced um, kind of things that happen that might put people at risk for relapse. So just. Briefly, um, we've done a couple studies. We did one pilot study where we tested out this program and followed people for four months, comparing them to a treatment-as-usual program that was mostly 12 steps, psychoeducational, after they had come out of an intensive um, treatment. So we were looking after care. How can we help these folks not relapse? Um, participants here, again, just to give you a snapshot of these folks. Many homeless, unstably housed. Primary drug was alcohol here. And one of our initial questions was, is this, does this make any sense? Can we really do this? Can we get people who, many of whom, like, they're not even housed, you know, living in their cars or in group homes or are on the streets, and we're asking them to meditate? I don't know if that's going to work. Or they can even show up for this. So we found that um, they tended to show up about on par with, um, with the other groups at this agency, so about 65% attendance. And we were really surprised at, uh, the rate at which people did engage in the practice. Over the eight weeks, 86% of the folks said they did do these formal practices. We gave them CDs. We gave them CD players to play the CDs. <laughs> we gave them whatever they needed to help support them. And even uh, two and four months after the course was over, still over half the people were reporting that they were engaging in these practices for about five days a week, about half an hour a day, the folks that were practicing. And then. We looked at them four months later, um, and we compared the, the two groups, and we found that indeed folks in the mindfulness group had a um, greater sense of awareness of their own processes and also a sense of acceptance. So remember, those two, are two of the things that we target in, in mindfulness is a sense of non-judgment and acceptance of experience and also awareness. And we also found uh, significant decreases in craving and substance use. Um, just to briefly say that we found a, um, a really interesting uh, relationship to depression. So that folks, when they were having difficult emotional experiences, those were still arising. But the folks in the mindfulness group versus the control group didn't have as much craving associated with that. So this suggests that they were able to be with that 
um, that experience of depression without immediately wanting to get rid of it with a substance. We did a, another trial very recently where we just got to do a, a little bit longer follow-up, 12 months, and we got to um, compare three different groups, so a cognitive behavioral group and a mindfulness group and a treatment as usual group, again, at the same agency, so it was a 12-step based group. And um, our participants look primarily the same here, is the same agency. And what we found over time here, you can see post-course, um, the, the treatment as usual group is that top blue line there, and the relapse prevention is the cognitive behavioral relapse prevention group, that's the green line, and then the mindfulness group is that red line. So you can see right out of the gate here, um, there's some changes happening. It looks like at six months, the, um, the mindfulness and the relapse prevention group are doing better than the treatment as usual group, but they're pretty comparable. But then what happens here at 12 months is what, where it's really interesting, is where you can see this is a survival curve here. So the lower the, lower the better. These are the people who are um, not, uh, not using days of use. So um, what you can see here at the end is that something's happening here where it looks like the folks in the mindfulness group are able to maintain these changes longer than the folks in the cognitive behavioral group or the treatment as usual group. So there's something about this that's sustaining over a year that seems to be helpful. Just briefly to end, um, some things, some work that we're doing out in the community. We're starting to begin to uh, work in incarcerated settings, working more with aggression and that kind of um, tendency to um, move towards violence or aggression. Uh, we're also working with um, some uh, adolescents who are incarcerated, working with conduct disorder, again, a lot of violence, a lot of um, gang-related activity, and also starting to uh, move into uh, tobacco cessation, specifically in Brazil. The, the government there is very interested in bringing in some mindfulness-based work to, um, to look at smoking cessation. And I'll just end with a couple experiences that I think can maybe better explain than, than I can. These are the folks that we we're working with um, that, that are describing what, what they experienced in this group. I paused and I watched my breath. These urges and thoughts would keep poking their heads up, but they got quieter and just weren't as big of a deal. So these experiences are still happening, but I can be with them differently. So I sat until I feel like I didn't have to act on these thoughts and feelings. I saw the situation clearly. I could make a different choice. I have more patience with myself, compassion, ways to get me back into what is happening, get me out of my head. So coming back to the present moment out of that second circle of reactivity. I'm now able to regularly surf these kinds of triggering situations, not just with drinking, but other discomfort or unpleasant states. And with that, I just want to acknowledge my colleagues and our funding sources and uh, Mini Med School for inviting me, and thank you very much for your attention.